Welcome, welcome to another Creative University session. I'm Peter Chotti. I'm the chairman of Creative University. And today's going to be another great session. Uh, we have a wonderful guest who's award-winning, critic critically acclaimed music supervisor, Thomas Golubich. Am I saying your name correctly? First, You are. I'm very impressed. Yes. Okay. Well, well I, I, I try. I want to make sure that I'm correct. But it's great to see you today, Thomas. Likewise. Thanks for joining. Good. Thank you for inviting me. So where where are you right now? Where are you doing this podcast? Oh, I'm in uh, Silver Lake. I'm in a neighborhood of Los Angeles. Um, uh, this is actually the 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 downstairs uh, studio, my library. So this is, as you can see, there's a lot of music behind me. Yeah, uh, this is sort of like a a, a, a veritable playroom of uh, inspired uh, art and culture all around me. Uh, and I'm sure it would be a, a vivid sight if there was an earthquake here as well. So there you have it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, uh, some of that priceless vinyl, I got to be careful about, but that's a beautiful, a beautiful stack. It's, it's a lot of stuff. I don't know if it's priceless. I think most of the stuff is uh, just valuable for its inspiration as opposed for oh. its uh, monetary value. But uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend trying to lug this stuff down the hill, <laughs> to try to sell it at a local record store. You're probably not going to make very much, but yeah, but enough. don't sell Stay, keep, for all of those, you have vinyl out there. Just keep it, keep it and enjoy it. Agreed. So Thomas, um, I will ask you first, before I get into your bio, I always ask my guests, because I'm a big music guy, I always, that's my passion, I always ask them to choose a song, any song, to start the session as people are logging in, so the, the kind of the hold music, mm -hmm. and you chose the song Lucinda by... A, an artist or band known as Relay, Relay. it's hard, it's R-E-L-Y-A-E. And yeah, I'm, I don't know how to pronounce it either. I just, <laughs> I just found it on Spotify at some point and liked yeah. it. So it seemed like a, an easy uh, introduction. This is the um, deepest cut of any song that's been requested by any one of my guests. And for all of you out there, I urge you to check it out because that's the beauty of being a music supervisor, right, Thomas? You, you unearth these gems and this one has only 25,000 listens on Spotify. So. Yeah, I think part of our job is is I think to to stay really current and and to listen to things that are new. Um, I think especially for a music supervisor, it it really is um, it's a really valuable thing to constantly hear brand new stuff because it, it you know it reminds you of how much great music is out there, even if very little of it might ultimately be placed in projects. I I love finding new music. I love finding new artists. To me, it's it's and right now is the best time to do it because we have access in a way we've never had before. Well, and, and they'll be interesting to talk about. Uh, and for all of you out there, it's a live session. It's interactive. So feel free to send your questions in. And I'll ask Thomas, send them through the Q&A function on Zoom. Uh, and we'll do that either throughout the session, but I'll save room for the end for sure to go through that. But first, before we begin, I want to give a little bit more about Thomas's bio because it's pretty amazing. Uh, Thomas is a three-time Emmy-nominated supervisor, music supervisor, DJ, and twice Grammy-nominated record producer. His music supervision credits are, it's a very long list, too many to mention, but I'll try to list a few to do him justice. The AMC series Better Call Saul, uh, Breaking Bad, I've heard of that one, Halt and Catch Fire, The Walking Dead, the Netflix series Grace and Frankie and Love, the Amazon series Sneaky Pete, and the Showtime series Ray Donovan. Thomas also helped launch the career of Artesia, this is interesting, by creating one of what is considered to be one of the most me memorable uses of music in television, the use of her song Breathe Me in the final scene of the HBO series Six Feet Under. And in 2017, Thomas became the president of the Guild of Music Supervisors the same year he was nominated for the first Outstanding Music Supervisor Emmy Award for his work on Better Call Saul. But beyond just that, there's more. Um, and first, how we got into it, Thomas's formative years, musically speaking at least, were spent as a DJ, music program, programmer, and on-air on -air host for Tastemaker, LA radio station KCRW 89.9, which is a great one. And after ending his 10-year residency there, he turned his attention to music production, live DJ work, all kinds of things. And he is known as, as somebody who's out there as an active, innovative DJ. And one of the things we were talking about before, he synchronizes and rescores projects 
featuring live DJ rescores of classic films in theaters. It's pretty amazing. And that work has been featured at Sundance, Sundance as well as Bonnaroo Music and, and uh, Arts Festival. So well-rounded, all kinds of things, dabbling, experimenting, and that's really amazing that that's part of your background is not just how people think of a music supervisor, you reimagining what a music supervisor can be and what just an artist can be. So welcome. Well, thank you. Thank you. It's a uh, very kind. <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think there's something really uh, fun about the restlessness of figuring out ways of taking things that you love and, um, presenting them in new and unique ways. And yeah. so I think that most of the projects that I've really loved have been ones where I got a chance to try something out new and, and hopefully people responded to it and, and liked it. Um, and, you know, my radio show at KCRW was uh, sort of a, an imaginary soundtrack to a different uh, film every week. So mm -hmm. I got a chance to like sample movies like Dog Day Afternoon or Cool Hand Luke and tell the story with little snippets of dialogue and then have songs that were thematically tied to that story. And then the synchronized project, which you mentioned earlier, was a really fun project where I got a chance to essentially present classic films with contemporary music in a way that you would not have seen it originally and then mix it live so you would never know that the music had been changed. Keep all the dialogue in there and just very carefully move the music in and out throughout the performance. So if you had never seen the film before, you might not know anything had changed, which was, you know, I don't know if I always pulled it off, but I certainly tried. So... Let's talk about that for a second. Sure. Because no two performances or re reimagining of the film's score and sound were ever the same because you were doing that live in theaters to these classic pictures, correct? And changing them, yeah. So like, for instance, I would do, you know, I did it as a monthly residency. <laughs> I haven't done it in quite some time, but I did it as a monthly residency here in LA. And part of the problem was uh, is that it was copyright violations, which meant that um, as soon as it became popular, I would get a cease and desist letter from a lawyer and I'd have to shut the whole thing down. So it was always this sort of like running game of doing the 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 doing each month a different film. So I did about 30 of them overall in the course of a few years. And I love doing them. And, and each time I would do it a little differently. Like I did one, which was with uh, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, a film I love, but I did it with hip hop beats. So I just found all these really fun hip hop tracks and just kind of played them underneath the Oompa Loompa songs and other areas and just found a way to kind of give a new personality to the film. So it was a way of kind of recontextualizing it and making it a little bit more of a fun you know candy colored horror movie you know in right a, right way. um and then i took a film that people didn't really know very well called i am cuba which is a beautiful beautiful film and, and filled it with a mix of electronic music and um very sort of latin influenced music so it was a way of kind of playing with contemporary versions of latin music as they were being interpreted by uh like electronic music and DJs at the time. And it was just a fun way of showing a really beautiful, really unique film with a completely new soundtrack. Which is pretty amazing when you think about just the love and the work that's put into that when it's a relatively small venue, it's all idiosyncratic. Every performance is gonna be different. And it just shows the love of music that you have to do that. And as a, as a reformed intellectual property entertainment lawyer from back in the day, I can say, that's not copyright infringement. What you're doing is you're, and I truly mean this, you're giving a new platform for this music, exposing it to new audiences and new formats, which is now, by the way, the entertainment business is beginning to understand the power of, of enabling or allowing that to happen. One quick related tangent on that. So as a business person, it's fascinating to like the Disney movie Frozen. It was, the, it was a massive hit. Much of the credit for that is given to the fact that Disney for the first time allowed people to use the songs in their social media without trying to shut them down. And so technically that would be copyright infringement, but Disney understood the power of the social sphere to be able to be the best. We consumers were the best marketers. We were passionate about the frozen and the songs and that built the audience. So there's a, you know, this is kind of a stand down to lawyers to understand and have the business people and creative people on top control them to understand the bigger picture. But so that's, those kinds of things are happening. But let's talk about 
Thomas, your journey into all the things you do, and then we'll get into some specific projects. And then I want to make sure that for the students out there and artists out there, specific thoughts you have about how to break into the business, um, how to think of the business and opportunities in it. But your, your journey from being a young kid and ultimately getting into the chair where you are today and all along the way, kind of in a, you know, kind of a condensed, your short, but key moments in your life and passion. Right. As you get older, it, it, it becomes harder to be, uh, <laughs> to be condensed, but, um, <laughs> yeah, that's true. um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that the, the, the love of, of film and music, um, probably became really obvious when I was 10 years old and my dad took me to go see, uh, 2001, a space odyssey. Um, and we saw it in, my dad was a professor, uh, at Boston university and we went to the Nickelodeon theater, which at the time was little more than a bunch of plastic chairs in a tiny little room, you know, in, uh, um, in Boston. And, um, even though the chairs were plastic and uncomfortable and the movie was very long, I was riveted by it, absolutely riveted by it. And as a 10 year old kid, it was the 10th anniversary of the film. So it was 1978 when I saw it, I was born in 68, the same year the film came out. And I was really, really transfixed by it. And something about the poetry of it, the the abstraction of it, the, the, the classical music, the way um, the storytelling worked, the way it didn't tell you what it was trying to do, it kind of let you have your own version of it really transfixed me. And um, I think that was really the starting point. It was kind of obvious that something about storytelling really grabbed me. And then all through high school, um, my best friends and I were all music heads and we would all go to record stores and we would, you know, collect many of these things here behind me. So we, you know, we just loved finding new things. We loved discovery. We loved sharing it with each other. We loved competing because we were a bunch of guys who were all like, like trying to you know, find the coolest new thing. And so there was a really great camaraderie that got built out of that uh we're doing a podcast right now which is really just five best friends from high school who are now many decades later still doing the same thing which is sharing music that they love and choosing different years to kind of present it to each other and that's just sort of like the kind of joyous stuff that you start doing and you kind of never stop um what's that, the name what's the name of that podcast uh, it's called Deep Cuts Lost and Found. We're actually going to be launching, I think, in July. It's a French company called Angle. Ah. Uh, releasing it. Um, yeah, so that'll be, uh, well, we'll see. They're French, so it could be August. <laughs> um, <laughs> but uh, it's it's been really fun. And I think that yeah. this stuff kind of is consistent for me. So, like, when I went to um, college, I ended up going to film school and really focused on that. My, my original degree was in writing and literature and philosophy. And then at some point, I just realized that I wanted to take all that reading and all that learning that I had had it and apply it to, to storytelling. And that's what led to film school. Um, and then I was a journalist for a long time, uh, which was uh, an interesting side, you know, uh, gig. Um, and then that led me to moving eventually to Los Angeles and coming here. I started an internet magazine, um, which was a total financial disaster. It was a little too early. It was an, uh, an early internet magazine. Was it music? Was that a music focused magazine? No, actually it was not. It was called the LA magnet. It was the Los Angeles magazine on the net. It was trying to be a model of what we have here of the LA weekly or mm. the LA we had at the time LA village view and the LA reader. These were sort of like contemporary alternative publications for culture. And yeah. the thinking at the time was that all of these companies, especially these studios that were in town, were all getting the internet soon. And I thought, well, all of these people who are young people who have money to spend and love culture, it'd be great to give them a home on the internet where they can find things. Um, we were just too early. And so I, we, we were up and running for, I'd say three or four months before we just ran out of money and you know, the advertising model wasn't there yet. And it just, uh, it just didn't, you know, I've had a lot of failures. So that's one of the failures, but uh, it was fun. It was a fun failure. An important point for everybody to understand out there that no career goes perfectly. There are many failures along the way. Certainly I have as well. Yeah. Pa failure is a huge thing. I think that you have to be prepared for it and you have to kind of say, all right, when things don't work, you try and at a certain point you just say, all right, that didn't work. The best lessons in many ways are the hardest ones. So, mm. and I'd say for music supervision, the first few projects I worked on were tremendously challenging. And I think because they were so difficult, I was able to have a longer run because I didn't expect it to be easy. And when it was easy, it was just a, a wonderful surprise. Okay. So you had that publication that, that didn't, 
didn't achieve the success you wanted. So you know, it was to, in your view, it, it was a failure in your view, but none of these things, as we said, are failures. Ultimately at the time you think life is over. I'll, I'll speak for myself. When I had my moments, it, it's like, okay, now what do I do? But you continued on. Did then, did, did you then go into KCRW at that point before you became a music supervisor or was that at the same time? No, no, that was exactly the route. So I had started this internet magazine. It failed miserably. Mm -hmm. And I had been listening to KCRW. KCRW is actually one of the reasons I stayed in Los Angeles because it was a hard, you know, it was a very lonely city. I didn't know anyone here. I don't come from an entertainment industry background. You know, my, my dad's a professor of, of marine biology. Like I had no connection to the city ultimately, but I was falling in love with it largely by listening to the radio and driving around. Um, and in doing so, I really fell in love with KCRW. It was a radio station that was really open-minded and creative and exciting and dynamic. And um, I felt particularly in love with a, a spoken word artist named Joe Frank, who had just incredible stories and was just a great gifted orator. And um, so I, anyway, I was a big fan of the station and they announced that they were going to have an, uh, a website and that they needed some volunteers. And so I thought, well, like, you know, maybe I can teach them how badly I screwed up and help them not make the same mistakes. So I volunteered there, which was really fun. And I kind of helped them put together a proposal to get a, a design. Um, and then uh, I really liked it there. Everybody there was really nice and warm and very uh, engaging. And someone said, oh, you know what, the music library, uh, you like music, the music library is looking for a volunteer on Tuesdays. And I was literally a, kind of between careers. Again, I had like lost a ton of money on this thing. And I was yeah. working uh, as a temp, you know, at the studios. And I just thought like, well, I've got time on my hands. Let me just volunteer on Tuesdays. And that led to a wonderful friendship with Gary Calamar, who was a librarian at the time there. Um, and slowly but surely, uh, as I was there, people heard me playing music in the library and I would kind of dig through, especially like the classical and the international selections, things that people didn't play that much. And I would find these interesting songs and DJs would be like, what is that? And I'd be like, oh, it's a really interesting artist. They're from, you know, uh, Soweto and they have a really interesting sound or this is a, a classical composer from like the 16th century and it's really early vocal music and things like that. And so someone said, why don't you put together a demo? So I put a demo together and um, to my great surprise and, and, uh, and happiness, they said, you have a show. So show up on Saturdays at 2 a.m. until 5 a.m. And you can play pretty much whatever you want. Just don't swear. And uh, that it. was the greatest gift I could have asked for. And so even though the hour was late and, you know, the audience was always a bit strange because who's up at that hour is usually a very <laughs> interesting group. You know, it start off with people who are in the clubs and it would end with people who are going to church. Yeah. Uh, it was uh, a wonderful way for me to navigate those uh, experiences throughout the three hour window. So it was a, a great gift. Uh, and that led ultimately to music supervision because um, Gary Calamar, who was my, again, my friend in the music library, he started to look into music supervision. Um, and uh, I ended up working for a, a colleague of his uh, as an intern. And that was a tremendously valuable experience. I learned a lot. Um, and I definitely learned how important it is to sort of seize the opportunities and work really hard. Listen, I want to pause there. There are so many things that you mentioned that are recurring themes in this series when we speak with people. And because ultimately it's, it's so there's an understanding from, from those who are watching and listening of, of you know, some things that they can learn from and, and understand first you did not have any kind of roadmap to get to becoming a music supervisor. It, and you, there, so there was no game plan. Um, and life happens and you took certain opportunities and you seized them and that led to the next opportunity, but you didn't see this uh, you know, far ahead. And that's something that we hear all the time from people who are sitting in the chair when I'm speaking with them. Secondly, you know, the, the failure thing that we already talked about that there's gonna be multiple failures and at the time it seems devastating and it may be, but then you move on and it's amazing what that could, it can open up entirely new possibilities. Another thing that's really important. There are, you, you who are listening and watching out there, you may think you know what position or what role you wanna play in the media and entertainment or music world. You may think that, but unless you're exposed to a wide variety of things, you, you don't know what you don't know. And so as you look for your first internship or gig, one thing to keep in mind, and we've talked about it a lot, is that um, you may have this idea of what's the perfect one, but what Thomas here, 
first of all, he, he didn't have any connections, created an op, he seized an opportunity to be a volunteer. He saw it, he seized the opportunity. You know, I, I'm sure you would have loved to have been paid, but you were happy to be a volunteer and do that. That created a relationship that then brought him to the next opportunity because he proved himself that he was doing really interesting things and committed to it. And that led him ultimately, that relationship, those opportunities, as they may not have seemed to be the perfect ones at the time, led him to what he's doing today, which is a dream gig for somebody who loves music. So when you're thinking about your internships and jobs, seize the day more than anything. That's my, my advice is seize the day. Like if there's an opportunity, even if you don't think it's a perfect fit, take it and then work hard with passion and create the, the initial relationships because then that opens up a world of possibilities. So a lot of great things there, Thomas, about just lessons for people to understand. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I think in many ways, one of the nice things uh, that I found about the entertainment industry as a whole is that it is really uh, supportive of people who start from nothing and simply work hard. And I think that one of the things that um, I've always felt is that I have to work hard on every project. There's never a project where I feel like I can kind of coast through or not take it seriously. Um, I, I really try really hard and use my resources well. You know, there are projects where I might co-supervise with somebody and we might begin very much working equally on it. And at a certain point, one person is probably a better match for the project and they're mm -hmm. able to take more of a lead. And then it's like, all right, my role now is support. I don't need to have my ego in the way. I need to make sure that we're delivering on the best work possible. So you kind of have to always rise the occasion, whatever that is. Um, KCRW was actually wonderful in, in teaching this lesson because it really is a volunteer run organization. It's mm -hmm. an organization that says, hey, we're an open door. We need your help. If you come and help us, we will keep an eye out for opportunities for you. And the people that really showed initiative and were really willing to put the effort in and were passionate and were excited, they just got better what they did because they were doing it all the time. And I think that that's one of the great lessons I've learned too, is that by doing things over and over again, things that you love, which are the only things you really can do because nobody wants to do something they hate over and over again, um, you get good at it and you simply do it by practice and hard work. Um, and I think that uh, the field of music supervision is filled with a lot of people who think this is a great job. And a lot of them drop out because it turns out to be much more difficult than they expected, <laughs> much more challenging, far less well compensated than they ever would have imagined. And they just finally say, you know what, it's too much. I, I you know, I'm going to do something else. But the good part of music supervision is you have a lot of opportunities to learn about the different fields that are out there. And sometimes people realize wow, I didn't realize how much storytelling was part of this. I really just want to champion music. They might be much better suited to be working for a licensing company because maybe they love to watch movies and TV shows or video games, but they are really into championing one artist or making an opportunity happen for them. That's not what a supervisor's job is. Supervisor's job is to be a storyteller. So it can be very helpful because you're in the middle of so many industries to see which area is maybe right for you. So let's let's talk about, first of all, what you just said, that a music supervisor is a storyteller. So tell us about your daily life as a music, what what it what it is to be a music supervisor and how you spend your hours in your days. Yeah, I mean, you know, we work myself and my team. I have a team of of three people and myself is four of us total. Uh, we work on multiple projects. Uh, you have to just for the economics of the job. We get paid very poorly, so we're almost always having to kind of struggle to make ends meet and to pay people regularly on salary requires a lot of hustle, which means that you have to keep the projects rolling. So projects tend to overlap. So uh, and they're at different phases. So, for instance, when we get hired in a project, for example, we are reading a script We're we're getting to know the producers. We're building a rapport with them. We're talking creatively about what do they need? How do they approach music? Will they need a composer? For instance, a lot of times we're leading the search for finding a composer for a project. That means that we're meeting with composers, getting to know them, how they work, what their availability is. We're navigating with uh, different agents who might be the representatives in between. Um, that's all part of the early part of a process. We're building mixtapes, different ideas. Um, I tend to get very into characters, so I, a lot of times we'll put mixtapes of different characters together. Even if we never hear their music taste or never get a sense of them, it will allow me to get to know that character more by kind of thinking, what is their world like? What were they like when they were 15? Like, Did they stop listening to music when they left high school or do they listen to music now? Um, 
and, or even having thematic songs like what is the soul of a character what do they want like good drama almost always has characters that want something what do those characters want and how can music help to express it so a lot of that is brainstorming that you do early on and then as you get further along let me get, let, yeah. thomas just one question about that sure. brainstorming early on is that um how much of that is done with the filmmaker i'm sure it varies depending on who the filmmaker is but is it tell, tell us a little bit about that the brainstorming process that you've seen yeah, it can be very different. Every project is different. Sometimes I will do a ton of brainstorming and we'll put all these mixes together. None of them will see the light of day in the sense that they'll never get sent to anybody simply because the producers are either, um, you know, very busy trying to just get the show off the ground and they don't have time to listen to music or they don't really listen to music very often. It's not really their focal point. They just want you to do the job effectively. So they're not really interested in those ideas at this point. It might be that you're prepping them for the editors. So the editors are prepared for it. Other times you're dealing with people who are very actively involved. Um, for Better Call Saul and Breaking Bad, we do meetings with the writers before the writer's room or even far into the season. Like when we have the general outline of the stories of the season, we meet with them and then we build mixtapes and we send that along to them. And sometimes some of those songs will show up in the scripts, sometimes not. Sometimes they're just inspirations and ideas. It helps us all figure out what story are we trying to tell. Um, so every project's a little bit different and you kind of have to read the room. A, a big part of our job is getting a sense of how can I help? How can I best be um, a useful part of this effort? Is it going to be sending a lot of music out and having a lot of discussions about music and having lots of meetings about music? Or is it really being kind of an invisible force that's prepared for when you need it be? And then when you need me, I'm really, I've already thought these things through. I've already got mixes together. I've got ideas together. Um, and then when do you present those ideas? Um, you're also dealing with studios. So you have a lot of times the politics of the studios and the uh -huh. studios agendas. And you have to be aware of what they're looking for and be able to figure out how do you make everybody feel like the ideas that are being presented are their ideas? Like, how do you make everyone feel invested in those solutions? And that becomes a lot of thinking things through and figuring out different approaches. And there's a lot of strategy that comes into it. Oh, I bet. I bet there is. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that. Um, compensation because you mentioned it mm -hmm. it's music supervision sounds like a very sexy job you know it sounds like it's really cool and you know as a music guy myself uh, that just the idea of being i love the way you put it a storyteller you're truly a storyteller because music is such a fundamental part of all these projects and the spirit of it all um but all you were talking about what it is to be a music supervisor which is all encompassing and compensation is not strong. So explain what that is, like to help, help students out there understand the realities of the situation. Right. Well, I mean, generally speaking, if you're a music supervisor, you're probably working independently. Very few. I mean, there are supervisors who work in-house um, and they're in a completely different situation. But I'd say the majority of music supervisors are independent. They get paid, myself included, by episode. That means that for each episode, we have one fee. And that fee has not gone up in a very long time. It's It's mm. been kind of frozen for a long time. The problem that comes into play is that when we were dealing with, for instance, in television, a network show would have 22 episodes and that, that production schedule might be for eight or 10 months, right? So in that time period, you have 22 episodes. I work a little bit more on boutique television, which means that it's usually a 10 episode cycle and they frequently go over a year in production. So the math becomes very simple. What you can do in 22 episodes at one fee and versus doing 10 episodes at a longer window is radically different. So a project, especially with delays and the pandemic, I think made this really clear to people. Um, we were we did not have a sustainable business model. We were in a situation where because suddenly the everything shut down, there was no monthly payment. There was no, you were, we're not a union. So there was no ability to be compensated. It was just like, okay, we're shut down now. So you can invoice us for the work that you've already done, but nothing else is forthcoming. And because we live in a country that's very dog eat dog, there was really no great public support. And it just became, I think for a lot of supervisors, a really devastating time because we were kind of in a barely breaking even business model already. Um, and now suddenly we were in a spot where it just stopped and there was no 
follow up. It wasn't like, you know, we could just shut down and we had people on salary, which meant that every month that we didn't have um, income coming in, we were losing money hand over foot, just trying to keep people paid. So it, it's, it's unfortunately a very compromised business model. And because we don't have a union because we don't have any sort of like structure. And if a project runs long, you simply eat the cost. And that happens a lot. You know, projects will they'll fire a showrunner or they'll find out that their production schedule is much longer than they need it to be and they have to extend the window. We're never paid for that difference in time. We have to stay on that project all the way through. We're also one of the first people on board because we are literally at the very script point. So when nothing's in production yet and we're there until the very end because it's the final mix that we have to be there. So yeah. we're an actor or a DP is there for a month or for three weeks or whatever the window might be. We are usually there for six to eight months or a year. In Better Call Saul, it's over a year of the production window between the first moment we start on board and when we've mixed the final episode, it's well over a year. So it just ends up becoming a math problem as much as anything else. So all the elements that you're talking about, your of what you do, the politics of meeting with the studios, with the executives, the filmmakers, uh, you know, everything, everything you do, the mixtapes that you do on your own that may never see the light of day. It's for a fixed fee for each project, right? And you had mentioned that the the fee hasn't really gone up for a number of years but there's no union so it's not a union scale right it, it depends on what level you've achieved and just i don't know if you have an agent or a representative how does that work uh, there are agents and and managers out there i don't have ones i didn't find them to be uh, effective for me uh they are for other people um i think that the the problem that we bump into i think overall and not to get too deep in the weeds with money but mm -hmm. is that because the studios have all the leverage, they're able to basically push back. And because all you can do is say no, the only leverage we ever have is just to say no. And I've been doing that a bit more lately where I've just said, you know what, if you can't get to my rate, I'm just gonna pass. Yeah. Um, and you know, at the same time that we're negotiating for our rate, you have usually showrunners or you know directors who are also looking for their DP and they're looking for their editor and they're struggling to get all those people on board. So they have to really be in a situation where they're saying, I really need to work with this person uh, for them to fight for your, your fee. So generally speaking, it's kind of a take it or leave it. And I think most of the studios treat us that way. It's like saying, here's the rate, you can take it or leave it. And if you take it, you know, and also there was a, a, for a while we had soundtrack residuals. So the idea was if there was a soundtrack album, you could have points on that soundtrack. Now that business is gone. So basically Spotify has essentially eliminated the business. So even in the additional compensation component, that doesn't exist anymore. So all you have is the fee. And if the fee hovers at the same low amount per episode and it extends a longer and longer window for when that episode gets finished, you know, it becomes a very simple situation where it's just an untenable situation for us. So you have to take on multiple projects and just hope that they all overlap in a way that doesn't become a scheduling nightmare. But um, it's very challenging. And I think that if there's anything that I would really love to see change for the profession, it would be either have it become a union gig or have it be a situation where the studios smartly enough say, you know what, we've been undercompensating these people for a long time let's make a gesture of goodwill and start to bring them up to the other professions that contribute in storytelling. You know, casting people were able to unionize. And I think for them, that became a huge difference in their ability to have a, a working living standard. Supervisors drop out all the time. They either get hired in-house or they leave the profession altogether. And to have the top people in a profession regularly leaving the profession, I think is a sign of an unhealthy ecosystem. I think that's unfortunately what we live with right now. Well, so for those who want to be music supervisors out there, what is your, just help them understand kind of the size of the business of music supervisors, like some scale of, of I don't know if there are hundreds, tens of them, hundreds of them, thousands of them that can make a living. I'll put it that way, whatever that is, can make a living in being a music supervisor. Well, uh, the Guild of Music Supervisors can probably be more accurate with the the current numbers. I can't really speak to that, but there's probably a couple hundred that are active full-time music supervisors. There are a lot of other part-time supervisors. Mm -hmm. People will have another job and they'll do this in addition to that. Um, I think that the, the key part is, and again, I find it frustrating, but there are ways of making it work, you know, and I think that 
part of it too is the area that you focus on. If you are, for instance, doing video games and you're able to get a job at Ubisoft or any of these big companies, yeah, you know, you're probably in a spot where you're compensated properly and you have, you know, health insurance and you have other benefits and, you know, you can keep that job as long as you essentially do the job well. Um, if you are, for instance, uh, you know, working in-house for a production company, that can be another job which is sort of covered well. I think you have to kind of pick and choose your comfort level. You know, I, mm -hmm. I've, I always appreciate being independent and I love building things. So I'm not so interested in being in a situation where I'm watching other people build things. So I kind of want to be in a spot where I'm able to build it and be on the front line. With that comes the sacrifice of stability and yeah. with comes the sacrifice of being able to say, I know that I'm going to have, you know, the benefits of retirement, you know, like I have to figure that out on my own. And that's kind of the way the business works. Yeah. You're a true entrepreneur. And I think that, that again, that's another uh, recurring theme when we speak with everybody, especially as the world is changing and the model of film and television is transformed. And like you said, there's no back end participation like there used to be for music supervisors. It's just a different world. Now, the reality of that, if you're an entrepreneur, is that there are a lot new, uh, many new platforms that are out there. And you mentioned games as an example. Sure. All of these forms of media, music is fundamental to virtually all of them. And so there are opportunities out there. But for everybody out there, it's really critical to to understand how the business is transforming. So if you're if you're a music person and want to have this kind of a life you are entrepreneurial in that way and seek things out and make opportunities happen for you. Uh, I, what is your, Thomas, what is the favorite part of your job and the least favorite part of your job? Oh, that's a good question. Um, favorite part of the job is, uh, is definitely for me, both discovering music that I'm really excited about and yeah. even more so discovering um, a moment where a scene and a song have a marriage that will in my mind last forever. It's that, it's that incredible synchronicity between, you know, having the music moment and having the, um, having a music moment really resonate in a story, uh, you know, and that happens at all sorts of hours. Sometimes it happens, you know, middle of the afternoon and sometimes it happens at four in the morning for me more frequently late at night, but it's, I, I love it so much, especially when you've been looking at a sequence over and over again for days on end and trying different ideas out. And then suddenly you realize there it is that just opened everything up. Like now that moment resonates in a way where it never had before. It hadn't even with no music. It's now opened up a door for that character or that story or that moment or even that series. Um, when that happens, there's no greater thrill. It, it just feels like you've been able to crack a code that just just is just exquisite um you know, what, the least, yeah. what, was, what was your in your career what was the biggest like the most satisfying aha moment where you cracked the code do you have something that was really memorable to you oh man there's a whole bunch of them um yeah it's it's almost like you know every project has got a few of those you know um well one of them was in breaking bad uh we had a very important scene in i want to say it was the second season where uh, the character Walter White had gone to a hardware store and he was there, he was kind of, you know, recovering from cancer um, and he had just begun his sort of meth empire, but it seemed like he was kind of getting out of it or he was sort of in a transition point. And he sees another, he sees a kid, a teenager going shopping and he can tell by looking in his cart that he's looking to make meth. He has all of these ingredients, but he's got it all wrong. And he very kindly stops the kid and says, hey, you got it all wrong. It's not the matches, it's the striker pieces that you need. And you shouldn't buy it all in one place. You should spread it out so you stay under the radar. Almost like he's being a teacher, which is what he originally was. And then suddenly he has a moment of clarity when he's in the checkout line and he realizes, I'm not a teacher anymore. I'm a drug dealer and this guy is my competition. And he goes out and he confronts the kid and his boss, the guy who's essentially the 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 want to be meth dealer and he confronts him and he has this moment he says stay out of my territory and in that moment uh to me it was such a key moment because it went from his own view of himself in one way and then turning into another way and i had spent hours and hours and hours in the sequence i knew how important it was i knew this was a key moment in the development of this character um and i stumbled upon a song uh by tv and the radio called dlz and 
it just as soon as I hit play, the scene just woke up and I just suddenly was like, there it is. And when the lyrics landed perfectly and the story it was telling was just speaking to it. And I just was like, and I didn't know if we could afford it. And that was the next struggle was that we didn't have any budget for this thing. And we almost weren't able to have it. I didn't even want to present any other ideas. I just felt like this was it. I did present a bunch of ideas because of budget reasons, but you know, Vince uh, really responded to it the same way I did and said, there it is. That's it. And then the struggle was, how can we afford this? And that was not easy. Uh, yeah. it, really, really challenging. And we were finally able to push it through, but we had to steal money from several other episodes. We had to convince uh, the studio to back it. Everybody fought us on it. Everybody was worried about budget and was forcing us to let go of what was at that time a really exciting idea. But thankfully, we were able to get to the end of it and, and got a lot of help from the, the, the publishers and the different companies involved to get it to a price that we were able to afford keeping it. But that was one of my favorite moments. Yeah, and and by the way, on that point, it's kind of like the frozen uh, comment I had before, where Disney saw the light and decided to not go after the people who were building the market opportunity for that film. That there is, at least with some people I'm talking to in the business, starting to understand that the idea of having their music featured in a soundtrack or in in an episode or in a film, that's going to build the value of that that music and the artist in the eyes of new audiences and expand it. So rather than trying to just take a pound of flesh at the beginning through a license fee, dropping that fee, hopefully more and more on increasingly. So because there's that understanding of the bigger picture for them financially. Okay. So the least favorite, and I'm going to move kind of rapid fire. Uh, sure. So we get into Q and a, cause there are a number of questions and I'll get to them, everybody. Um, so your least favorite part of being a music supervisor. Probably the part that I just mentioned, actually, the the financial struggle of having to convince, you know, companies that often don't care that something is worthwhile. Uh, one of the worst struggles I dealt with was also on Breaking Bad, which uh, an art, a publisher tied to an artist would not budge. And it was a song that was really important to us. It was important to story. It was important to Vince. It was important to everybody. And they just didn't care. They were just like, you know, we need this much money. It was all about money to them. And to not be able to, no matter how passionate I was, how much I articulated, how much effort I put in, they were just like, we're happy to see the opportunity go away because we don't want you to not pay us what we're worth. And to me, that's exhausting. Like, I don't like wow. to haggle. I don't like to negotiate. I, to me, I will use all the money I have and put it all up on the screen. I'm not interested in saving money. I'm interested in using all of it and using all of it really well. So when I come to somebody and say, here's the rate that we have, that's what I have. If they come back and they say, oh, well, we want more. Now I'm in a situation where I have to convince someone else to take yeah. less. Yeah. which to me is, 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 is really heartbreaking at times. And so it's always very frustrating if I feel like somebody is not um, considering the fact that we really have a, a, an exciting use for it, what you described earlier, that this is going to be beneficial to everybody. But some companies don't operate that way. And those are usually companies I won't go back to if I can avoid them. Yeah. So for you future filmmakers out there, take note of that, that think about the bigger picture. First of all, Thomas is a storyteller. And so your story is going to be stronger if you have the right fit with music, you know, if you have that optimal kind of fit. And then in terms of the financial aspect of it, it, it all leads to the bigger picture. Well, actually, so, one other note to that. Yeah. Briefly. I think it's also important that there's always another solution. So I think for filmmakers in particular, and this is what happened really with Vince and the team, when it became clear we were not able to clear that song, we chose something else. And we chose a, a horse with no name. By America, which turned out to be great. And it was an inspired choice. And I think in many ways, it said more about the character than the song that we originally had that we were having all that trouble with. So I think there's always another solution. So I think for filmmakers, they should always be prepared to be flexible and to collaborate in the solutions. And the same thing for us. When you find things that are really great and exciting, but they're too expensive, there's always another solution. You should always be open to finding a new way of making that work. So let me ask, uh, I'm going to get into a couple of these questions and, and then expand a little bit about them. Brianna asks, she says, I've considered music supervision as a career as someone who is re researching different careers in the industry. We've talked a little bit. She asks, is it true that music supervision is extremely stressful and demanding? And so you've expanded upon that a little bit, but help Brianna and others out there understand what are your 
insights or thoughts about how best to become one. So let's say that's the path you want to choose. How do you break into the business of being a music supervisor? Yeah, I would agree that it is definitely stressful and it can be very difficult. But I think also, if you really love something, that still becomes part of the love of it, you know? And yeah. I think that, like, I've, I've had a lot of jobs that were very stressful and were very challenging, but I love them. And so, therefore, that love was returned back to me because I put a lot of passion and energy into them. So I think that no matter how stressful these things are, I think it's important for people to moderate their stress. Nobody should be in a situation where they're living a miserable life because they're pursuing a dream that is not working for them. You kind of have to make your own judgment as you go. But I think also it's really good to figure out where your barriers are, where your boundaries are. And I think that um, to, to, to figure out how to do that best is to put yourself with the right people. So for instance, if I had, uh, I luckily worked with really good mentors and I learned a lot not just from what they did well, but what they didn't do well, you know? And so I think that it's really good when you're, um, I'm a big fan of internships. I'm a big fan of education. I think, you know, um, I spearheaded the, uh, the Guild of Music Supervisors conference. And to me, I'm still, it's one of the things I'm proudest of to have an ability for people to show up um, on a conference again. Now it's digital before it was live. Hopefully it will be live again. I think that's a fantastic way to start. So if you're interested in the field, I think go to, uh, if there is such a thing, go to a conference, go to a lecture, check things online. The more effort you put, things like this are really, really valuable. So I think just learn, 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 you know, read books about it, follow it, do it on your own. One of the nicest things in the world now is that literally if you have a laptop, you can take your favorite movie, put new music into it and experiment and that's try cool. things out. I think it's an incredibly fun. And that's what Synchronize was. It was me saying, okay, I've got limited technology. I've got limited technical abilities, but I'm going to find a way to make it work. This is what made hip hop great. It's like, I got two tape players. I'm going to play them off of each other, but I'm going to find a way to make something cool out of it. And I think that that's really a driving uh, way of being able to make that work. Also, if you're able to get an internship or if you're able to work for a, a licensing company or work tangentially in the business, even if it's just as a volunteer, even if it's just as an intern, I think it's a great way of getting a sense of what's around me, like what seems to be the better job. Music supervision might sound great, but for some people, it will be too stressful and it might not be the right thing for them, but they might know you know what, I still really would love to, I'm really interested in publishing. I'd like to learn more about that. Or I'm interested in residuals, maybe working for an ASCAP or a BMI is a better place because I know that I'm key to helping artists do great work. Maybe I'm really into score, like score is my thing. Maybe it'd be great to work for an agent and, and see if I have an opportunity to do that. Or better yet, if nobody gives me that job, why don't I go find somebody whose talent act as their agent and essentially as they become more successful, I have a great ride. I think almost every great partnership I've seen has happened because somebody put energy into something, put some love into something, and it just began to blossom on its own. I don't think that people just land in their perfect jobs. I think they work hard and they work smart and they find the right mentors. Do you think that, um, well, that's great advice. Uh, do you think that Something that strikes me, if I were sitting in the shoes of some of the young people out there and wanted to become a music supervisor, does it make sense to reach out to the filmmaking side of your college or university and collaborate with it and work together on projects so that it's a symbiotic relationship? You're helping them, they're helping you, and you're learning together and experimenting together. It seems to me like that could be a cool way to get in. Absolutely. I, I think that's actually excellent advice. One of the things which I've seen, which I think is not very smart, is people will go and want to arrive at their perfect job from the get go. <laughs> right. You know, it's right. kind of like, you know, like I would love to work with Stanley Kubrick, but honestly, like I'm not ready to work with Stanley Kubrick. I wish he was with us. Um, it's one of those things where like I will aspire to. I think I got a chance to work with Vince Gilligan. I think Vince Gilligan and Peter Gould are among the Stanley Kubricks of my generation. So I feel very lucky. But I also know that that's a gift and I've worked very hard to get to that gift. I think it's really good to start where you are. So if you're starting out, um, my, my first advice would be if you want to be a music supervisor, probably there's some sort of a film program or some sort of a media program somewhere near you. It's driving distance or some distance to get to. Go to those screenings. When they do screenings, which they do almost every semester, go in there, show up and just see if you can catch what's there 
and talk to those people. Um, I know a lot of people have gone to film festivals and they've just basically gone and said, hey, I'm not going to go to the big movies. I'm not going to chase after the ones that are going to get released on major you know, studios. I'm going to go to the shorts section or the animation section. And that's where, or the international section. And then I'm going to meet somebody who's from Israel and says, hey, I'm a music supervisor. I loved your short. I'd love to work with you. Well, now we're in a situation where you can literally hop on Zoom or hop on uh, an email and do an entire job with a filmmaker from Israel who ordinarily would have nobody available to work as their music supervisor. It's taking initiative. It's finding a way to find people whose work resonates with you and being sincere and genuine. And by being sincere and direct with them, you find opportunities happen. And maybe you're working for free, but if you love doing it, you won't mind it. And if you do it and you don't love it, now you know it may not be the right thing for you, but at least you tried. Listen, such great advice to everybody out there being entrepreneurial again and seeking these non-obvious ways to, to pursue your passion and getting back to the way you got into the business, which is you took a volunteer position. Mm -hmm. It's not, and, and so the expectation that you'll be getting paid a lot of money at the get-go because everybody wants to set that aside. You're young, you know, take, take your time, enjoy, demonstrate, prove, prove yourself, work hard at it. And the relationships are going to get you in relationships more than anything are going to help you get to the promised land of what you want. So now I'm going to go um, really rapid fire. But let me actually ask one other thing too, sure. that I think is important sure. is to be resourceful because one of the things that was like, I don't have any family money, so I had to find a way to make a living. And thankfully I didn't have the support of family while I was doing it. Some people have to do that as well, but I worked a full-time job and I did my music supervision projects at night. So I found a way to kind of actually it was the opposite. I did them during the day and then I ended up working my project at night. So by finding ways of being able to make yourself self-sufficient, that opens up opportunities. You know, um, you don't need money to if you can find a way to keep your expenses low and be smart and resourceful and really be able to do two jobs at once. That is in many ways the secret to it, because if you're in a spot where you need to get paid immediately, it puts everybody in a spot where it's like, we don't make that much money ourselves. So we're not really able to like, I have people ask me all the time, Hey, can I work for you? And I realize you have no idea how difficult it is to run a company in California and how much yeah. you have to take care of to make sure that you are on the up and up and that you're doing it all correctly. That means every hire that I do is an incredibly important decision and one that has a lot of economic impact. And the pandemic made really clear if you don't have your business running smoothly or you have an exterior event that shuts it down, you now have to let go of people that you cannot bring back. Yeah. And that is a really hard thing. So I think being able to be self-sufficient is really valuable and being able to take advantage of those opportunities and just put yourself out there. So I didn't mean to cut you off. but No, 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 no. Absolutely. It's a wonderful advice. Uh, okay. R lightning round now. Anonymous attendee says, in your career, what is your favorite sync you've made happen? So a little bit different question than the aha moment where it was perfect or the Breaking Bad. Maybe it's different. What's your favorite sync you've made happen? I don't even know, honestly. Um, you know, I think there's ones that I, I think it's a little bit like it's not my job to do that, I think, in a sense. Like, I think the idea is that every project is unique. Um, I just had a song that I absolutely loved that was in a project I'm working on right now. And it got replaced like we there was a political reason that we couldn't include it so it kind of went away it was totally heartbreaking to me and i was super upset about it and then suddenly i found another solution and the other solution worked really well and now it's going to be in the show and everything is good again so i think in many ways there is no such thing as a favorite sync i think each moment is its own opportunity to do something great and to hope for the best and sometimes things just line up really well and sometimes they don't and when they don't you have to just take it on the chin and say all right it could have been something else it wasn't that but it's okay there's going to be another opportunity and there's always another way of finding a solution so I, I, I'm dodging the question. I don't really have a favorite thing. I think they're all my favorite sinks. And I just hope that, you know, the ones that resonate have uh, a lasting value. Excellent. And then anonymous, another anonymous attendee says, what are, who are some of your favorite artists at the moment and which artists help you get through the quarantine? Oh, wow. That's an excellent question. Um, well, actually, the, the, the podcast that I've been working on, Deep Cuts Lost and Found, has actually been like a really wonderful thing i i 
did not listen to podcasts much. I mostly watched a lot of movies and 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 listened to a, a lot of music um, and, and watched TV shows because we live in a great time period for that. Yeah. Um, so I was not listening to a lot of podcasts, but I found a few that I really liked. And I noticed that what I liked a lot about certain podcasts was the chemistry between the guests and, and, and the hosts. And uh, I think that working with my buddies and basically sharing music with each other kind of evolved into this. And we started doing different years. So we started with 1977, uh, which we thought was a pivotal moment for us because we're, I'm 52. We're all, we graduated high school in 1987. It's 10 years from when we graduated high school. It's the beginning of, it's sort of like the height of punk and the beginning of post-punk. It's an interesting pivot year. And so we thought that's a great year. So just diving into those years and finding the music I loved. And then we did 78 and 79 all the way into the contemporary time. It was such a joy to go back into those years and why, and, and also it had to be a deep cut. So the idea was I did not want to have things that were the hits. It was always like, what is that album track that you kind of forgot about, but it's kind of amazing. What was never a single, mm -hmm. what was the B side? And to me, that was such a joy. Another answer to that would be, um, I was, uh, I got, I was really absolutely riveted by this sound called GUM, which is G Q O M. It's from South Africa. It's a dark, house music, which I uh, discovered, or I, actually I was introduced to when I went to um, South Africa a couple of years ago. And I've been listening to GUM artists and I find them fascinating and fantastic. And it's really dark, interesting. And a lot of it's in Zulu, which is a beautiful language. And it's like, it's like dark hip hop mixed with house music in a really compelling uh, sound. And it's usually made by very young people who are not professionals and are just making really interesting, compelling music. It's also awesome to dance to. So Kum has been a big part of my uh, pandemic. So hopefully that answers the question. Is there any emerging artists right now that uh, you see on that is starting to bubble up, but in the early days that you, that is resonating, who is resonating with you and that you recommend people to check out? I mean, there are tons. I tend to not like name drop artists only because okay. I that it gets to be a little bit political and I have a lot of friends who are like, why didn't you name drop me? So yeah, yes. I, I try to, I listen to a lot of new music. I use certain resources like hype machine is for instance, a wonderful uh, website where you can hear ah. new releases that are on blogs. Uh, it has a very international point of view. So I find a lot of international music I'll find on hype machine. Um, and I'll find things on Spotify at times. And, you know, I'll, I do a lot of digging on the internet. So to me, a lot of what's exciting about that is I love hearing something for the first time. And I think that in many ways, I feel the same way about filmmakers. Like I love when I hear something for the, I see something for the first time. I haven't read about it. Nobody's hyped up the artist. No one knows anything about it. And I just watch it. Um, and so I think that in many ways, finding new music, finding um, new filmmakers, finding new television shows is a really exciting process, especially when you go in blind. It's one of the best things about film festivals, honestly, is not knowing much about it reading a little bit and being like, oh, it's a film from Kazakhstan, but it's why I'm a female director who made a weird experimental movie. And I'm like, all right, that's got enough interesting components. I mean, it could be God awful, but it could be incredible. And so to me, that's an exciting way. And I approach music the same way. It's like, where did it come from? What, what is it all about? And I find that the, the discovery process is so exciting. It's just, I find it riveting. And, and, and to me, exploration is so rich right now you know you have the ability to find filmmakers from around the world uh you know musicians from around the world artists from around the world it's just a great time to be discovering things so it's a little bit of a cop out i don't have a specific favorite artist right now i'm working on several projects so i'm constantly hopping from all right, I'm now doing a, you know, a live action anime and that's completely weird international music from around the world. And I'm also doing Grace and Frankie, which is kind of like an R&B kind yeah. of a sound. And I'm also doing Better Call Saul, which is a very eclectic, very open minded palette. And, you know, all these shows are a little bit different. They all have different requirements. So in many ways, it's just trying to find ways of using all of this stuff that I have in my head and finding a way to paint it well. Well, it's interesting because that's, that's a, a an important point for those who want to become music supervisors to understand that it sounds like a breadth of palette is important because the projects that 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 are out there, um, especially across all these multiple platforms, and it's increasingly a global world of creativity, that that's going to serve you well, right? To have a broad palette, not get overly pigeonholed in one certain genre. 
Absolutely. I, I would say in many ways, going, going back to the idea that music supervisors are really primarily storytellers. And to be a storyteller requires you to adapt to each particular story. And that means that there's another approach, you know, for instance, like I didn't know much about country music until I did a project that was country themed. And it was a fantastic exploration for me. Like I loved going down the rabbit hole of country music and really opening that world up. And now I'm a huge fan of country. So that's one of the great gifts of these jobs is that it just says, Hey, we got to do something in this particular world. Can you help us find things that work? So I take my knowledge of storytelling, my empathy for the characters, my sensitivity towards how do we use music well, and then I get to explore a whole new world and find what's resonating with me, what makes it special. And it must be incredibly satisfying when you do discover a great artist or songs out there that aren't in the mainstream, you bring them to light and they begin to bubble up and impact a broader audience that that must be incredibly satisfying it is although i have to be honest like i don't think it's much of a at least for me personally it's never been a big focal point like you know mm -hmm. you mentioned the sia song earlier and i i realize it's in my bio so it's not like i'm unaware of the fact that it was kind of an interesting and unique situation but i certainly feel like sia is a very talented artist she was going to find an audience no matter what we happened to catch her relatively early and we were able to find a really prominent use for her song. And, you know, I think that that was a, a, a wonderful thing. And I was really excited to see the success that she generated from it. But she wasn't successful because of Six Feet Under Placement. She just basically had a, a platform where people suddenly were like, oh, who is that? And they were able to recognize that talent. That would have happened in another way, in another platform. So I try to be really careful to never pat myself or my colleagues on the back too much for this because we're not there to break artists we're there to tell stories and if it does turn out to really help an artist i'm thrilled with that because a i'm happy to spend money their way i know that that money will help them continue to work it will sometimes be and i've had conversations with artists before where they say you caught me the perfect time like i was ready to throw in the towel i was kind of done the industry had burned me out and that little bit of money that little bit of acknowledgement help me feel like, okay, it's worth going out there. And people reached out to me saying, hey, I heard your song in Halt and Catch Fire and I never knew you as an artist. And now I've been listening to the records and I've gone so deep because it's a period piece and I'm so excited to have found you. I love that that happens, but that's not my job. My job is to basically tell a story effectively. And then I'm always really happy when there's great side you know, benefits that happen for the artist and for the audience as well. No, I totally get it, completely understand. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just, you wouldn't answer the question like who you're one of your favorite artists. It, and I understand why, because you work with multiple artists. One of the most cinematic for you out there, I'm sure many of you, because I've had a number of sessions where I've mentioned this artist that I believe has very cinematic songs and has been licensed very fairly broadly, but still under the radar is Ben Cooper, who goes by Radical Face. And I did an interview with him several months ago, which is one of the creative university sessions and it's incredible to hear his artistic process his creative process how he approaches it beautiful cinematic song so i urge you to check out radical face everybody out there last question and then i gotta let you go mm -hmm. we talked about those who want to become songwriters but from an artist perspective if you're a musician and you're thinking how how do i approach I'd like, I'd love for my songs to be part of a film or a, a story of some kind. How do I even approach that, uh, making it become a reality from my thought to reality? Any advice there? Yo, absolutely. I think that's a, it's an excellent question. Um, I think number one, it's very important uh, of what is the intent, you know? Um, I've had many artists that approach me not as a collaborator, but as a potential resource of income. And that's almost always a turnoff, you know, because mm -hmm. if you come to me with an agenda saying, hey, I want you to give me a whole bunch of money for something that I made, um, I'm almost automatically not interested in having a, a broader conversation with you. If you are really responding to the work and you feel a connection to the work and you have a sensitivity towards the work and your work is, you know, appropriate for it, 
I'm happy to check out the music and listen to it. So I think that ultimately the problem being that there are only, as I mentioned, a few hundred at most music supervisors who are active. And there are literally thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of artists who are looking to get into licensing or, or have their music licensed. So I think it's always very smart to approach many of the middle companies. That means if you have a record label, go to your record label and say, these are the shows I'm really into, or these are the projects that I feel really I care about. Do you have a licensing arm that could help to pitch my music for those people? Or is there a way that I could build something that might be a playlist specifically geared towards that show? Um, there are third party licensing companies that specifically focus on placements. Some of those can be great. So you, and I think it's important to do your research. So if you're a music artist and you have a specific kind of sound, it's kind of helpful to say, what is like that sound? Like what are the artists that feel some, that have a kinship towards that? And then you look up what companies are representing them for third party uh, licensing. Then it could be a good way of you saying, oh, I'll send an email out to that particular company and say, I know you have so-and-so, I'm a little bit similar. I don't know if you need two artists that are the same way, but if you're ever in a spot where they're not affordable, I own 100% of my music uh, and you know I'm able to clear it. I'd say that's a very important part. The number of times people have approached me or have, have I've been approached via other companies saying, oh, we'd love you to clear this and there's uncleared samples or yeah. you know, the, 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 they're not business ready. That is an immediate dead death knell because for us, we move very fast. Our jobs are very stressful. They move very quickly. And if I get something sent to me that is not business ready, meaning that they know who the writers are, the publishing is sorted out, there is either a third party licensing company or clarity on how that clearance goes. There is no uncleared uh, samples. And the first question I'll ask is, that's a really cool horn section. Can you tell me about how you recorded that? If you can't tell me how you recorded that, that means you sampled it. And that means that if you can't identify where you sampled it from, I will not do business with you. And you probably killed the possibility of me ever doing work with you. I've had a few situations where people have also been duplicitous about, um, you know, rates. And, you know, we, we did a quote and then somebody decided, oh, I'm going to angle for more because they really want this. <laughs> That yeah. is the fastest way to never do business with me again. And we're a small community, which means that if you screw me, I'm going to tell all my friends not to do business ah, with you either. So yeah. you kind of have, it's an ecosystem. You got to come in from an honest integrity and come in with clarity and also have your business ready. Know that you've done all your legwork. You're ready to get licensed. You've done your homework. You're working with the right people. You're prepared. That way also metadata, huge thing. The number of times I get MP3s sent to me and I really love the music, but there's no information. I don't know who to reach out to. There's no contact. I will literally delete it out, even if I love it, especially if I love it, because I don't want the frustration of having to dig through my emails to see, is the song love song going to show up somewhere in a way that will resonate with me? And I'll know, oh, that's the version. Yeah. So have your metadata prepared. Just treat it like it's a, it's like a store. And you have a price tag, you know, in your mind, but the idea being that you say it's an easy, clear, I'm just looking for opportunities. That's really helpful. If you own hundred percent of something, you can say, I really want to see the opportunity. Let me know what a real rate is. I will always be honest. And I'll always say, this is what we have. You know, I'm not looking to cheat anybody. I'm not looking to bargain shop. I'm looking to use things in a smart way. And if I know that you're prepared and you have all of your business stuff taken care of, and I can trust that this will not come back to haunt me or it'll be a problem with the studio, then we're in good shape. Thomas, thank you. That's great advice to everybody out there. And Really appreciate it. I know you gave us more time than than I had requested, which is wonderful for you and very generous with your time. Love what you do. I think it's, uh, as a huge music person, I, I just think it's fascinating to learn more. And for everybody out there who's interested at all in film, television, media in general, the business end of all of it, you, it's critical to understand this kind of uh, a role and how the how this all works. So Thomas, thank you. Keep doing the great work that you do. And uh, thanks for being a friend to Creative University. Great to have you. Very much. It was a pleasure being here. Take care, everybody. Good luck out there.